recording now. And well, hey, Patrick, thank you so much for setting your time aside here to have this conversation with us. And I think there is such a relevancy to your work today uh, coming into 2021. I think a lot of us feels like we've missed out a lot in 2020. You know, there's choices, your works, the fear of missing out, the fear of better options as we go into 2021 and hopefully, hopefully coming to an end of this pandemic. Um, I thought it was such a relevant conversation to bring your works and your, you know, findings and your philosophies to the forefront to our audience. So thank you so much for setting this time aside. And really, most importantly, thank you for the pioneering thought around these two issues. Thank you. That's so kind of you. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things where, you know, I think back to my 20s um, and I think about some of the life choices I made and I was absolutely super guilty of the idea of just going to do things and make choices that really weren't grounded to my values or my choices or what was most important to me because I just like I wanted to be in the mix or in in something as well as just this paralysis by analysis and thinking, oh my goodness, like do I, like where did you begin to see these truths and decision making and like what empowered you, what values made you think, gosh, like this would be extraordinarily impactful for people if they could understand these biases that we have, um, how did you uncover this and what, like what led to this discovery? Yeah. So I grew up in a small town in the state of Maine, a very simple place as a kid, you know, we had, um, I remember, you know, and it's, it was a different time too. I grew up in the eighties. Like you'd go to the mall and you would have three pairs of pants that you bought when school started. And that was it. My parents were like, that's what we can afford. Life was quite simple. And, you know, I remember we didn't have cable, so we had no choices. And so, and there wasn't that much to do, frankly. I mean, in my hometown, we would drive around in our cars and like go past the Dairy Queen and beep the horn and yell out the window and then just turn around and do it again. So that was what my childhood was like. And then I went off to college and I lived in Latin America and then I came to New York and then I was, you know, went to Harvard Business School and I realized. I, these were choice rich environments. I, as I got older, and this happened to many of us, you have much more things that you could potentially do. And while I love that, I also was like, it was like catnip to me, and I wanted to do it all. And I'd also lived through 9 11, and, and I remember living in New York, and after 9 11, you're like, wow, the world is. I, I just don't even know what the what it, the world is about anymore, and and you want to take advantage of everything. So that's really where the FOMO came from, and the FOBO came from is this idea of like, I want everything perfect and I want to do everything. And, you know, I'm a very type A competitive person as well. And so, and so that, that's where it all came from. And then I sort of realized when I was in business school that I, number one, I was constantly stressed out and tired because I was trying to do it all. And number two, nobody ever committed to anything and it made it really annoying to do anything with people. And so that was kind of when I woke up to writing the first article about it. And then of course, as I uh, sort of went on with my life, I've realized I've seen the crippling effects of these behaviors and and, and other people and in myself at times, friends whose lives were ruined by FOBO, you know, the person who dates somebody for 17 years and then, you know, can't commit stuff like that. And I realized that this isn't just kind of funny stuff. It's not just kind of like something that's a meme or to laugh about. It's, it's actually really critical um, because being indecisive and living your life without being decisive is a massive limitation. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. You talked about the three kind of choices, like, like what are the implications of these choices in your works in FOBO and maybe share with that a little bit to help people in a concrete way. When we think about, Hey, I have this choice. How do we limit that down? Like right out the gate to help make those easy choices actually feel easy. Yeah. So FOBO or fear of a better option is the idea that because we think there's something better out there for us when we're facing a choice, even though we have perfectly acceptable choices in front of us, we wait hoping that it'll become clearer that we'll somehow have the, the right sort of data to make a riskless decision. Um, it's also the idea that the more option value we have, the better off we are. And so, you know, we sort of hold off and delay decision making. And so that has real implications in terms of you can't be a leader when you're indecisive. You can't innovate when you're indecisive. It's really annoying for other people. You alienate relationships. You know, you're the person who's constantly holding everybody up because you haven't made a decision yet or you haven't committed yet. And so uh, it's a kind of behavior that can be seen in the smallest decisions in life, literally like, what am I going to have for lunch? You're standing in front. I, I mean, this happens to you go to like a, 
you know, you go to the, the, the store to buy something to eat and you just stand in front of the rack of food at like the Pret a Manger thinking like, what am I, you know, there's so many choices. Um, it can also happen in big things in life. You know, what job should I take? Where should I go to school? Who should I marry? And so a lot of, uh, I did this talk uh, for TED Talk um, that came out last year called How to Make Faster Decisions. And one of the things that I realized is uh, for the small things in life, frankly, it doesn't matter. And the reason why you're stuck is because you're injecting a lot of drama into these decisions. And so pulling yourself out of the equation is a great way to sort of move quickly past these decisions. So I recommend outsourcing, outsourcing decision-making. Like I flip a coin when I can't decide between two <laughs> things because it just doesn't matter, right? Uh, and then on the big things, it's really about recognizing that all the choices are acceptable. You know, Limiting the ones, obviously, you eliminate the ones that aren't acceptable straight away. Get down to the acceptable ones. Uh, do your research, of course. You don't have to just you know, sort of frivolously decide, but then recognizing that when you're not making decisions, you're holding yourself back because once you make a decision, then you get on to the next set of decisions. And so basically finding a way, there's a methodology uh, that we can get into if, if it's interesting, where you basically eliminate different things from the table till you get down to one and then you are done and you have a decision. So it's really helpful. Yeah. And I, so yeah, I watched the TED talk. I think the TED talk's fantastic and, and we'll link to it in the show notes because it, I think it's sometimes that you've got some visuals with that. I think they're helpful to see in that talk. But one of the things I thought was really powerful is that so often we'll get hung up on the, so you, you also recommended using a watch, I believe as well in those decisions is that like, how many times have we asked our spouse, like, where do you want to go to eat? Right. And there's like three places maybe that we go to eat all the time before COVID when we can go out to eat. Right. Is like, okay, let's just take this down to a coin flip. Right. Um, and those sorts of choices, like where did that, like, how did you come up? Cause I think that was such an interesting, cause that eats so much time of our lives of just silly decisions of that we're, you know, ruminating over for no particular reason. Like, where did you come up with that understanding? Um, cause that would, that would get rid of a lot of stuff off of people's plates candidly. Right. So I started my recognition of this, this FOBO concept came when I was at Harvard Business School because there were so many things we could do. It, it was really social. It was all about Friday night. And I remember <laughs> I would have like seven events, literally, because you have 900 students and at least seven people are having a birthday uh, every week. And so you get invited to seven different birthday parties and people would like never show. It would be interesting. They would try to do like seven of them. And then they get to a party and be like, oh, like, this is just okay. Like, I'm sure the other birthday party is more fun. Or you'd invite them to something, you know, oh, you're going to come to my, I don't know, come over for dinner. And they'd say, well, you know, I have these other things going on. Let me get back to you. And they never would. And maybe they'd show up late. And I just realized, like, this behavior was very pervasive. And it was the first time I had seen such incredible um, amounts of ghosting and noncommittal and stuff like that. And I think it was also enabled by the fact that we were starting to get social media and we, you know, we were very connected and we all texting and all that. This is like the, this was like the birth of texting 2004. I, mean, I, I texted for the first time in 2003. I remember it well thinking, well, this is stupid. Nobody's going to do this. <laughs> um, we all had cell phones, right. For the yes. first time. Everybody. Yes. So you were suddenly like much more, you had many more just things that you could do and you were much more in the flow of information. And then when I, so I, I recognized that, but that was very, it was the kind of thing that, I remember thinking like, this is so endemic to the culture at HBS, but it doesn't ex like when I go back to the real world, it's not going to be like this. But of course, with the advent of, you know, just much greater connectivity, much more options, much more social media, this little niche problem for 900 kids in Boston became something that my parents deal with up in Maine. And so I, I think that um, that's really where it came from. It was I like to think of HBS, which is a place that, you know, is a wonderful place and, and I loved it there. And, you know, maybe people, I think sometimes when we think about a place like HBS, like it's, it doesn't seem very relatable, right? I remember thinking like, I don't know, I'd never met anybody who went there. It seemed like this really ridiculous place and it is in many ways, but I'll tell you, um, it was because of the fact that it was so extreme, it was a perfect Petri dish to grow FOMO and FOBO, but many of the things that made it that way have become widespread in our culture so how do you see this impacting business and maybe even like uh you when you see families and, and for that extent as well but like where do you see this issue impacting like everyday life and you know to counter that element as well as like why should somebody even care about improving their decision making process 
I, you know, I think that the reality is, and, and this could be either with FOBO or FOMO, which is, you know, FOMO is this idea that there's something better out there. So you try to do everything. And, and, and I, the example I love to give for businesses is, is when um, Crystal Pepsi was brought to the market. Do you remember Crystal it, Pepsi? Uh, unfortunately, I do. And I think so. Yeah. Does, and I think, unfortunately, Pepsi remembers too, right? Yeah. Clear Coke it's and Crystal good. Pepsi. These were just terrible ideas. It's funny because like ever since quarantine and COVID, like I barely drink any sodas anymore, which is interesting because like I, I never drink soda at home. It's always like a special treat. But in the 90s, when it came out, I was like, I definitely drank soda and I definitely wanted to try Crystal Pepsi. And Crystal Pepsi was Pepsi's attempt to stay relevant as Sprite became. I remember Sprite be, like came out of nowhere, like people drank Coke and life was simple. And then all of a sudden, like Sprite comes and it's like. It, you think it's like a healthier? I don't know. I don't, what know. I don't understand. Yeah. Yes. But we definitely were like, it was like Sprite was everywhere. And then so. It's the know, lemons. Like it's the lemons. Drink. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's tasty. Yeah. Um, but like, so Sprite, you know, is the hot thing. And so like Pepsi tried to copy them. The point being that um, when it comes to both of these things, whether it's trying to be everything or never deciding anything at all, how can you be successful in business or in life? when you're indecisive. Because um, the thing that really uh, sort of people forget, and which is the pernicious part of this whole thing is, people like to think that somehow their, their set of options will be stable or grow. But in fact, the more you delay, the less options you may have. And I think a lot about, about Brexit or like COVID, hmm. where if we had had an effective series of responses early on, we'd have a very different situation. The more you delay, the, the, the fewer options you have because you're like, well, we can't just do a one week lockdown anymore. Now we got to do like three months or whatever. And of course, here we are today. And so um, it, it really is about uh, it, when you cannot overcome FOMO and FOBO, not only are you less decisive, but, you know, people don't trust you because like nobody follows somebody who's indecisive. Nobody. Couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Like, and I think one of the gifts that you give people when you are decisive is that you give them permission to to take risks, to step into decisions that maybe they make a wrong choice, right? Uh, Tony Robbins talks about this, where the best way to get to success is to make a series of decisions in one after another. Some of them are going to be bad, some of them are going to be good, but just adjust along the way. Like when you guide people through this process, and I'd love to dig into it when we have this these decisions that have more meaningful impact so houses jobs things of that nature when we know the outcome like actually matters right not like okay we're gonna eat you know like okay is it gonna be vanilla or chocolate ice cream like you're not losing right and just eat some ice cream and move on bud is what is that process you guide people through to make those tough decisions those big decisions and how is that meaningful for them when they're faced with those kind of things so when you're doing the important things in life, you're right, you're not going to outsource, right? That's That would be completely nonsensical. But what you do need to do is to sit back and think about, and let's use FOBO, for example, because we alluded to that a little earlier. Yeah. You think about the root causes of your indecision. And back to FOBO, the, what are the root causes of FOBO? Number one, it's this perception there's something better out there than what you have in the collection. So, you know, it's sort of like, well, you know, I let's imagine, for example, uh, a classical example is okay i got a job offer well maybe i'm interviewing at a couple of companies you start to get nervous you get that job well what about the other three companies i've been talking to and what about you know the companies i haven't even applied to yet you know i'd always wanted to apply to google but now i have this offer from microsoft and i don't want to do i don't want to take it i, I want to delay because if i wait a little longer maybe i'll get the offer from the other one and then i can have more things to choose from now it may be, and it probably is very likely that had you had I told you a month ago you're going to get a job offer from Microsoft and it looks like you'd be delighted and take it right there. But now that you've kind of been poking around, you start to create all these. Well, what if you know? Oh, I had an interview last week with Dell. What if they come in and double the salary? You have no data to back up that preposition pr presumption, but you start inventing the stuff in your head, right? The second thing that happens when you have FOBO is that you um, begin to value option value in and of itself. Just the idea that like, well, the more things I have, clearly I'll make a better decision. So like, let me just delay. And uh, again, it's like that that is a false assumption. And in fact, you may lose some things. It'll be like, if I were to tell you right now, the Microsoft offer 
Um, if you wait another day, it's going to be gone. How would you react to that? Right. And so that's the kind of stuff you need to start thinking about. And you need to sort of create a process whereby you force yourself um, to make a decision. The way to do that is number one, you've got to do your research. You have to know what your criteria is, and then you have to weigh the potential options against the criteria. Um, number two, you need to basically create a process where you pick a front runner. Okay, so here we have an actual offer. Let's the, the front runner is Microsoft, and then you start weighing the other things against it. Like, the, the, first of all, you don't even have an offer for Dell. Let's say that Dell offer comes in. Okay, and then you can compare them, and you could say, okay, which one objectively, knowing what's important to me, which one is a better one? You choose the better one, and then the other one is permanently eliminated. Why? Because the problem we have FOBO is that we're afraid of choosing the lesser of. So if we choose the better one, we feel good but we must eliminate the other one.